If I have a simple tulip bulb in my hand, and I ask you to look at it and say, what is it? You'd say, well, it's just a, a grungy mass of biological matter. I say, but look at it more closely. And if it gets nurtured in a certain way, that is, it's watered and put in the ground, it will become a tulip bulb. Why? Because it has built into it a future pull. A future pull that you can't see or dissect or find in any lab. It has a future pull, a picture that is part of its DNA, part of its genetic inheritance. If you take a liver cell from your liver and look at it and dissect it, and, and it has a future pull. It will always be a liver cell. It will never be anything else. In order for you to be able to manifest magic, real magic in your life, miracles, you must first be able to conceive of it. You must be able to conceive of it, and that means no doubt. And the doubt comes by shifting to a knowing rather than a belief. All of the stuff, Deepak and I are talking now about taking a group, making a movie, and taking in this movie a group of babies that are, a, that say, a hundred of them, and as they are born, we remove them from the environment that they're in, orphans and so on, children who are to be abandoned, and we place them into a world where there is no doubt, where they get past the lie. You know, we're led to believe a lie, as William Blake said in his wonderful poem, Songs of Innocence. He said, to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, to hold eternity in the palm of your hand and infinity in an hour, we are led to believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye, which was born in a night, to perish in a night, when the soul slept in beams of light. All of us are born in a night to perish in a night in the physical world, but the soul, the spirit, resides and sleeps in formless beams of light. We are led to believe a lie, a huge lie. And the lie is that there are limitations in our life. Imagine these little children being raised in a world where doubt and impossible and can't do are never exposed to that. Anything that they can conceive of in their mind, they're able to practice. They go to fire putting out school, 101. And in fire putting out school, here's a fire over here, and you sit here, and you work on it with your mind. And you put that fire out. You know what my kids and I do after dinner? Many times after dinner in the evenings, a couple times a week we go out and we put blankets on the grass. And in the blankets on the grass we uh, look up at the sky. And we kids say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make clouds. Who wants to make clouds? I want to make clouds, Daddy. I want to make clouds. <laughs> I'm going to make a rabbit. These, my kids, all, my, all the people in the neighborhood think that my kids are neurotic. <laughs> Those dire kids think they can make clouds. Why not? The same intelligence that flows through them flows through the clouds. Why not shatter the illusion of your separateness and believe that? Imagine a whole curriculum, a whole world in which you were raised to know that there was no doubt. And you can transcend that doubt. And when you do, you begin to see that miracle, synchronicity become very much a part of your life. Inspiration responds to our attentiveness in various and sometimes unexpected ways. For example, when I began writing this book, I debated between the two titles, Inspiration, Your Ultimate Destiny, or Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling. One day, while I was swimming in the ocean, I was going back and forth in my mind, trying out both titles. Still uncertain, when I'd finished my swim, I called Reed Tracy, who's the president and CEO of my publishing company at Hay House, from a payphone to get his opinion about the title. While I waited for him to answer, the word calling appeared on the miniature screen of the telephone. Nothing else, just calling. And then the word began to flash on and off, as if it were trying to get my attention. 
When Reed answered, I told him what had just occurred, and we both agreed on inspiration, your ultimate calling for the title of this book and this program. All of this may appear to be nothing more than a silly coincidence, but I know better. I think of the word inspiration as meaning being in spirit. When we're in spirit, we're inspired. And when we're inspired, it's because we're back in spirit, fully awake to spirit within us. Being inspired is an experience of joy. We feel completely connected to our source and totally on purpose. Our creative juices flow, and we bring exceptionally high energy to our daily life. We're not judging others or ourselves. We're uncritical and unbothered by behaviors or attitudes that, in uninspired moments, are frustrating. Our heart sings in appreciation for every breath, and we're tolerant, joyful, and loving. Being in spirit isn't necessarily restricted to the work we do or the activities of our daily life. We can be inspired and at the same time be unsure of what vocation to pursue or what activities we want to schedule. Inspiration is a simple recognition of spirit within ourselves. It's a return to that invisible, formless field from which all things emanate, a field of energy that I call intention in my previous book, The Power of Intention. My experience with being in spirit. When I'm in spirit, I have a feeling of contentment, but more than this, I experience joy. I'm able to receive the vibrational energies of my source, call them voices or messages or silent reminders, even invisible suggestions or what have you, but they're vibrations of energy that I'm able to align with as I get myself out of the way. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the world's great geniuses, once remarked, quote, When I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone and of good cheer, say, traveling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Whence and how they come, I know not, nor can I foresee them. End of quote. We don't have to be a genius to know what Mozart speaks of. The same force in a different way is flowing through you and me right now. I've learned to remove resistance to the free flow of this spiritual energy by reminding myself to align with it or to be in spirit in my thoughts and my expectations. When I sit down to write, my desire is to invite spirit to express through me, and I encourage ideas to flow freely like, like Mozart. I'm connected as if it were to my source in spirit, thinking and expecting to be the instrument of my spiritual source. Ideas flow, and whatever assistance I need just shows up. And, like Mozart, I can't describe how the ideas come, and I can't force them. Staying in spirit seems to be the secret to this feeling of being inspired. I also find that inspiration flows in other areas of my life when my primary mission is like what Michael Berg so beautifully describes in Becoming Like God, Kabbalah, and Our Ultimate Destiny. Quote, Just as every being is God's business, every being becomes our business as well. Unquote. That is, being inspired necessitates the willingness to suspend ego and enter a space where I want to share who I am and what I have in a completely unlimited fashion. When you feel inspired, everything works. The reason that everything works is because you have left the material, the physical world, the world of the ego, and you've moved into the world of spirit. And when you move into the world of spirit, into that invisible world, you get connected. And inspiration means inspired. And Patanjali said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new and great and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. There's some very important wisdom in that. This idea of finding yourself inspired means that you allow these dormant forces, these things that are in every single one of us, to come alive. Consciousness begins to expand. Things begin to show up in your life. You begin to manage the coincidences of your life. I wrote some textbooks back in the early 70s talking about the importance of goals. 
um, that I can't have them all withdrawn, but uh, I think that the you know, you go. I watch my kids, and they're, some of them are in college now, and some of them are out, and, and they're worrying about what what they're going to major in, and trying to set a goal. And uh, um, I just, um, I tell them just uh, to try to just enjoy every single moment, and just let yourself be guided. I think it's great, great advice for parenting. You know, it's just uh, guide, then just step aside and recognize that. All of us have the anchor of the universe located within us. That's what Lao Tzu said. It's in every single one of us. And let yourself, let yourself be swept with it. Let yourself be taken by it, rather than getting your individual ego in there saying, this is what I'm going to do. And You know, it's like Arthur Miller, the great playwright, um, he was asked a question at, a, at an interview with the New York Times. He was 91 years old, and they, and they said to him, are you working on another play? And he said, um, I don't know. He said, but I probably am. <laughs> and I understood exactly what he meant. I mean, I just finished writing a book that I put a year of my life into, This Wish is Fulfilled. And last night, I called my, the president of Hay House, my, my best friend, Reed Tracy, and I said, there's an idea germinating inside of me that I think will ultimately become a book. I don't know even quite, I just know it, it's, it's starting to excite me. And I, I've often been called the father of motivation all over the world. They've got this title they put next to me. And uh, I always say, I, I, if I have to be the father of anything other than the eight children that I have, I would choose to be the father of inspiration because I think it's the reverse of motivation. Motivation is when you get a hold of an idea and you take it where you believe that you can take it with your goals and the, any obstacles that come along, you're going to plow through them, you're going to make this thing happen. And um, that's motivation. <clears throat> you get a hold of an idea. Inspiration is an idea gets a hold of you. And it takes you where you were intended to go even before you were ever conceived. I can't imagine you as a little boy in Germany were thinking about, you know, being one of the most famous authors in the world. I mean, and, and, and how it all comes about and, and what's going to come next for you. And uh, like you said, even, I don't even know what words are going to come out next. It's uh, being, for me, it's just being completely immersed in the now and, and, and surrendering, just like turning it over. That's just what I do, I turn it over. And the most amazing things happen when you turn it over. That's when God comes into your life. That's when the, that's what Carl Jung called synchronicity. You have almost like a collaboration with fate. You're letting it all unfold. When the, in the midst of your writing, I don't know if it happens for you, but you know I, there'll be something I'm not sure or whatever, and all of a sudden I'll go to the mail or somebody will pick up the phone and it'll be right there. And it's like after a while you start to almost count on it. You start to realize that uh, you don't you don't have to do anything. You can just let it come to you. Um, yes. So I don't think you can be totally free of goals. Like, uh, you know, I have to go to the bathroom. Um, so I'm going to have a goal to go to the toilet, you know. I mean, so I, I don't think I can get totally out of that goal place. But um, by and large in my life, I just let it be. I think the Beatles had it right. When you find yourself in times of trouble, <clears throat> Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. There will come an answer, let it be. I don't know, that's my theme. <laughs> I think there is a time in some, in people's lives when there is, is a place for goals, but the important thing is the nature of the goal and if it arises out of inspiration, as you call it, or a vision that comes to you of something that wants to be created through you, it could be a book. When the power of now came to me, I felt this urge suddenly of writing. I bought a yellow notepad. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
and began writing the first line and at that moment I knew it's a book and I knew what it was about and it was very different from the kind of casual writing I had done before over the years, sometimes after sitting with people in uh, having a session, counseling sessions, doing meditation with small groups. I would sometimes say things and then later I would write them down because this was new to me too, but I said things that I didn't know before, they came out. So that was a more casual writing and then suddenly the, an energy stream came of a very different, more em empowered kind of writing. And for, from the very first moment I knew it's a book so in that sense, one could say, I suddenly had the vision of writing a book, one could say. As one could say, I had a goal of producing a book. But it wasn't something that came as, with the promise of delivering some kind of personal fulfillment to me in any way that I can become famous through that or I can make money through that, or I can become powerful through that, people are going to listen to me. All these could have been motivations for writing a book, but it was more like something, a realization of something that wants to come into being, and then you help it along, you go with it, you become a channel through which that, that wants to come into being, comes into being. Everything, remember, has a dharma. Every creature, every rose, and every human being has a dharma. You're already fulfilling it physically. You're already in the bodies that you were intended to be in. Remember what I said before, it is not about where you are, it's about what direction you're headed. And as long as you know you're heading in the direction of staying here in meaning. Now, this concept of a calling, I mean, I wrote a whole book about it. It's called Inspiration, In Spirit. And the subtitle is called Your Ultimate Calling. So I'm going to introduce a word here to help you to identify your calling. And that word is passion. And it doesn't make any difference to me whether that passion has anything to do with making a living or uh, it's a part of the DOT, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. What is it that you find passion about? And the only condition I place on it is that it is in alignment with God or with your source. All right? So that your passion, if your passion is about killing other people, for example, if your passion is about stealing, if your passion is about... Uh, I often said that there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. One of the ways to have the tallest building in town, always, is to go around and knock down anybody else's building when they start getting taller than yours. So as soon as they get up, if you're at the 44 floors and they get to 43, 44, you just go over and you put some explosives in there and you just blow it up and you say I, I have the tallest building in town and this is by the way our collective ego <laughs> this is what we do in our society and in our world and which is about if you really want to know my passion and my calling it's about shifting the entire consciousness of this planet before I leave it and that's why the film titled The Shift is so significant to me because I know that if I can get 10 million people to watch that film, The Shift, if I can get 10 million people in America and Canada to watch that film, that we reach something called Pi, 3.1416, remember? <laughs> and if you can get 3.1416 percentage of a population to align, the rest of it's called a critical mass in physics. You reach what is called phase transition. And if you align enough people or electrons or subatomic particles up and align them in a certain way in an energy field and you reach what they call the hundredth monkey, when you reach that point, all the rest of the electrons or the people in that energy field begin to align as well. And we have aligned ourselves collectively with 
a consciousness that uh, allows for people to knock down other people's buildings. The other way to have the tallest building in town is to always work on your own building and not be concerned with anybody else's building or what anyone else out there is doing or being consumed with trying to compete with or win or defend. To listen to your calling. So your calling is the thing within you that has your attention, that has your passionate attention. And it doesn't make any difference whether it makes sense to anybody else. It's the thing that you feel inside of you that you're here for. It's Mr. Holland in Mr. Holland's opus. And here's the secret. Here's the thing that I learned. That it's the presence of the passion. That when you have the presence of the passion within you for what it is that you feel is your calling, everything else will take care of itself. That is an indication that you have God within you and guiding you. The word enthusiasm and theos, yasm, translates to the God within in Greek. The God within. When you are enthusiastic about something, anything, when you have that kind of internal knowing that this is what I'm doing, and sometimes you have to, uh, you know, that Shakespeare's, he wasn't just a great writer, he was an incredible philosopher. Probably the most famous lines from Shakespeare are from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. And that's a very profound question. But what follows that is much more profound. He said, after to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and thus by opposing end them. You have to ask the question and that's what this program is about and that's what the movie is about and that's what the book is about and that's what all of it is about. To be or not to be? Am I going to be who I came into this world to be and there's something inside of me that has always been calling me to it? Or am I going to allow the slings and arrows of an outrageous fortune that has been imposed upon me by others to dictate my dharma? That's really the question. And it's a question that you can answer and respond to and live with. Do you have a definition for crisis? Like, what, what is a crisis? It's a gift. It's a gift. Um, everything is. It's interesting you mentioned the power of intention because I wrote that book in what you would call a crisis. Um, my wife and I had separated. Um, I was 60 years old. Uh, you don't break up when you're 60 and have seven kids. You know, you do that in junior high school. <laughs> and, uh, and for about a year and a half, I was in a, uh, the closest thing I've ever had to a depression, a clinical depression. Didn't want to get up, didn't want to, just couldn't figure it out. My wife had met somebody else, had uh, moved in with them and so on. And, uh, and my children um, encouraged me to just start writing again. They said, if you just write about it. And I really didn't want to write about it. Uh, but um, I had lost a lot of weight. People thought I was sick. People thought I was dying and, and so on. And that book was just, it was just channeled to me. And I think in um, moments of crisis, um, what it teaches us is to become more compassionate. And compassion is at the heart of, uh, of higher consciousness and, and enlightenment. The Dalai Lama said that if we could take every child on the planet and uh, have them meditate on compassion for uh, one hour a week, every child at the age of five, in one generation we could eliminate all violence uh, on earth. So that's how powerful he believes compassion to be. And I understood that because the power of intention was a, was a major shift for me. 
I began to um, look less uh, flippantly and less egotistically at the world and, um, and came from a place of, uh, of inner grace or, or kindness, gentleness, uh, love, what I call divine love. So that um, I've always felt that it is not always so important to just be in a state of gratitude when things go well and um, when you're around people that smell good and that make you feel good and that look good. Um, but uh, it's, it's the low, low points in our life, uh, reminders that um, there's something inside of us that um, wants to have an outpouring of love. See, even the miser who loves his gold doesn't really love his gold because of the gold. The gold is just another thing. It doesn't have any, anything, any love in it. It's just, it's just an object, a metal object. The reason that the miser loves his gold is because of the outpouring of love that he has for the gold. And that's true of everything and everyone. It, uh, it's learning to have this outpouring of love, and you don't just have to have it for people and events, but you can have it for, you know, for this microphone, and you can have it for the cameras, and you can have it for the wall, and the table, and the chair, and everything that you encounter. And I think for me, probably one of the, what you would call a crisis in my life was the diagnosis of leukemia uh, three years ago. And um, when I first heard that, that word leukemia has cancer all around it. Cancer has a lot of fear all around it. Uh, and even if you aren't afraid to die, which I'm not, uh, there's no point in being afraid of that. Uh, there's no point in being afraid of anything. Um, you still, um, there's that inbred sort of sort of psychic kind of uh, awareness that cancer and fear go together you know and and so it was uh, it turned out to be one of the great blessings in my life um, I encountered John of God down in uh, in Brazil and was able to have just this a magical experience around it but what happened is when I had this healing and, and leukemia was taken out of my body it was, um, it was, it wasn't so much that leukemia was taken out, what was taken out was fear. And it was replaced by love. Almost immediately, not almost, immediately after I had what they call the removal of the sutures, um, a week after the, uh, the surgery, this, this remote surgery, um, I started feeling just love for everyone. I walked out of the room that morning, seven days after the surgery, and. I looked at my children and I just put my arms around them. I said, you've just never looked more beautiful. Um, and I looked at the ocean and it looked like just a big bowl of uh, love soup. And the trees looked fluorescent and uh, every, th every person that I walked by and looked at uh, just became just objects of love. I went through a couple of uh, quotes. One was from uh, Valerie Hunt's book, The Infinite Mind, which is uh, the display quote for the sixth chapter of Spiritual Solution. She said, but I do not believe that man can perceive his godlike qualities until his field reaches higher and higher vibrations and attains a greater degree of coherency. No matter how hard we may try, to receive spiritual guidance, we cannot until our fields are attuned to that vibrational system called God. Let me share that with you again. But I do not believe that man can perceive his godlike qualities until his field reaches higher and higher vibrations and attains a greater degree of coherency. So that you can sit there in anger and in fear and in shame and all of the uh, uh, reactions in your life that compute to make you weak and that will make sense shortly and you can never come to know God according to uh, the minefield theory that uh, Dr. Hunt espouses and talks about and according to a spiritual solution to every problem because when you're not at peace you have sent your body into a vibrational field of energy in which you have allowed your mind to create the error or the illusion that you and God are no longer connected and that begins to take over 
And as hard as you may try, and no matter what you may do, until you can raise the frequency at which you vibrate, until you can raise the energy level at which you experience life, and move out of the lower and slower frequencies and into the higher frequencies, you will not be able to access and negotiate the presence of a spiritual solution to your problems. You see, the intellect has trouble with this because the intellect is the mind and the mind is the ego. If you ask most people, where is your center? Where are you centered? They will point to their head. Where do you originate from? Where is your source? Where is your ability to think and to process? They will point to their head and they will say, it's in my brain. My brain is what makes me be able to think and be able to understand concepts and so on. If you ask a spiritual being, where is your source? Where is your center? What is it that gives you the ability to understand these great miraculous things? They will point to their heart. And so, heart consciousness is very different than head consciousness. The head consciousness is one which tries to analyze it, so tries to figure it out, and has a great deal of difficulty with it because it's coming from this position of separateness. The heart is your intuition. The heart is the part of you that says, I know and I trust and it works for me and I don't have to convince anyone else of it. And once you have this, even prayer becomes not like... Uh, most people think of prayer as like... Uh, God is like this huge vending machine in the sky. All right? And... I put in my tokens, and I behave in a certain way, and certain things are going to come to me. But there's an authentic kind of prayer that is very different than this. And this kind of prayer is one in which your prayer is in communion with God, rather than separation from. I turn it over to this higher part, but it's not something that I'm ever separate from. That's trust. That kind of trust in combination with knowing that you're no longer afraid of being God. Know ye that ye are God. And I am in you, and you are in me, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. It's like this is something that we are being taught, and yet we have been conditioned almost to subscribe to another idea which says that I am not trustworthy, I am separate from, I can't do those things. That has to be transcended. You have to understand that in terms of people using it to give fear to you. And our greatest fear is the fear that we're going to be alone, that we're going to be abandoned. But this universal intelligence that is everywhere, this divine intelligence that is universal, that is in all things, how can it abandon us? Wherever we go, it's there when you trust in that and know it without any doubt you begin to see it everywhere you see it in the flowers you see it in the sunsets you see it in your babies and in your mother-in-law you see it in all places and what you're doing when you see it is you're recognizing that I am worthy and I am important and I am significant. Yes, I am connected to God. I am what God is doing. And that's the subject of the next person. Honoring your worthiness to receive. Thank you. If you don't believe what goes around comes around, the next time you see somebody down, just smile at them. Just say hello and be friendly toward them. And you'll see that what you send out is what comes back. Now that law of the universe is so powerful that it affects every cell in your body every cell in your body when you look at one cell in your body ask yourself what makes the cell work what makes a cell in your body work Do you know what makes one individual little cell work harmony and cooperation that's how cells work 
an individual cell. If what's inside that cell, the electrons, the neutrons, and the protons, and all that physics stuff that's inside one, if any of them get out of whack and start not cooperating or not working in harmony, what happens to the cells around it? They're affected in some way, aren't they? When one individual cell is affected in a negative way, that is, when it loses its harmony, when it loses its cooperation, then it affects negatively those cells around it. And that's the disease, all right? And that spreads to another cell and to another cell. And before long, the harmony within you is, you know, physiologically, is destroyed. There's two kinds of energy, supposedly, in every cell. One is the physics energy. Shirley MacLaine talks about this in her wonderful book, Out on a Limb. Uh, I recommend you read it. She talks about the physics of what is energy within one cell. And then that there's another kind of energy within a cell that scientists and physicists and chemists, none of us can figure out what it is, but it is what makes the whole thing work. They just call it the source. And that source, the nearest they can get to is love or cooperation or harmony, what we call love, which is just love. It's just cooperating and being in harmony with. All right? That's what love is. And that that is what makes every single cell work. <laughs> And when one doesn't work right, it affects the other cells. Now, for a minute, just for a minute, think of yourself as a cell, just as one big cell, okay? Now, one of us as a cell goes out of whack, goes amok, doesn't work right in some way. Does it affect those around us? One cell gone wrong can affect all the other cells around us. It's just a growth process, seeing bigger and bigger cells. But when you think about the entire size of our universe, which is endless, which we can't even begin to comprehend what endless means and uncaused causes and so on, then you are as big as one of those tiny little cells inside of you. And if you go amok in some way, then you affect those around you. And if our planet, which is just another cell, in billions and billions and billions of other cells, if our whole planet goes amok, that is, if we store up enough weapons and we do enough killing and we have enough hate and as a people we do that then we will not only affect everything down to that tiny little cell but all the cells in our planet in our universe and it will go on forever see I have taken to sending out ICUS a copy of my parable I send these books out to all influential people in the world in every field just the last two weeks I think our mailing lists have totaled over 4,000 at my own expense, just signing them and sending them out to all the government leaders, all the medical leaders, all education leaders, all people in celebrities data, all the people associated with different religions and so on. I'm just sending them out. All right? Now, many times when you send things out in the mail to a large mailing list, you get some back. Karma. Understanding how our universe works. In every single obstacle that you run into in your life, there's an opportunity. Every obstacle you have is a hidden opportunity. And seeing it, rather than as something to complain about or call your lawyer about or get upset about or, or anything in between, you see there is an opportunity in every setback you have in life, including everything you're suffering from right now. Everything, whatever it may be. There's an opportunity in it. Look for the opportunity. Look for the fulfillment, the potential for finding out what you're made out of, rather than for finding out how well you can say, see... I told you things weren't going to work out for me. <laughs> so I, in sending out these books, I'll get 100 back. You send out 4,000, you get 100 back, that's a good day. Okay, uh, only 100 came back. Now, most people who send things out free and get some back say, well, this isn't working, I'm getting these back, I get 100 back and all that. To me, it's like, how can I find that person? This is a test. To me, that's a test from the universe to say, what are you made of? You're just going to give up and not find that person? Or are you going to uh, go look for that person because that's to find out what you're made out of. And that's what I do with all of that and have always done. And somehow just knew to do that. When it's somebody says no, it's how can I figure out a way to go around that no? Rather than I think that they're right, I'll just give up. It's always how can I get around that? If you don't accept yourself, um, nothing else, no one else is either. Yeah. You know, it's like... You know, I think of it as like uh, we're all we're all creations of God. We, we all come from the same place. You know, T. S. Eliot said that uh, you know we shall not cease from exploration. 
but at the end of all of our exploring will be to return to the place from which we originated and to know it for the first time. And he was speaking about death, and I don't. I don't think, I, I don't take that as a, an explanation of death. I take that as an, a, an explanation of an, a, of an understanding that we all emerged from this place, the same place, that we're all connected. Everything in this universe is connected. Larry Dossie has just written a beautiful book called One Mind, yeah. uh, and I've just finished reading it, and it's like showing scientifically yeah. how everything is connected to everything in this universe, and you can't take anything and not see the connection to it. Uh, especially at the quantum level, so that um, so so you who you are is a, a creation of God. You know, in my in my book, wishes fulfilled, I talk about it's like one of the things you have to recognize is that your highest self is God. Uh -huh. You must be like what you came from. So a little tiny spark of who you are is is the Tao, is God, is divine mind, is Krishna, is consciousness, is Buddha, whatever you want to call it. And the Tao, the opening line of the Tao says, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. We can't find a name for it. It's just like, but it's the, the best name we can come for it is something called love. It's just love. It's divine love. And so this is what you came from. So if you don't accept yourself, you're not accepting something that, uh, you know, is, is, the, is the creation of God. You know, because... Truly, I mean, it's like the, the greatest wisdom that you can have is the recognition that you are a piece of this divinity. And I walk around with just, in a, you know, Rumi said, you know, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. I'm just in a state of bewilderment about it all. And when you accept yourself, you love yourself. And when you love yourself, that's what you have to give away. And the only thing that you can give away, and that's what a saint is, yeah. someone who can only give love away, because that's all they have inside. Yeah. That's been my goal in my life, is to just to have no enemies, yeah. to have nothing, and to particularly not to have make an enemy of myself, yeah. to love everything about myself. And while I was going through the last six months of this pain, the stuff we tapped on yeah. down in Australia and so on, uh, most of the time, and you've heard me say it many times, say there's a, there's a lesson in this yeah. for me. And I just had to do, I just did a public uh, television special, another public television special. And when I got an hour and a half before the show to start, I was in, I got one of these attacks again in the neck, and I was just like, you know, how am I going to get through this thing and so on. And I, I said a prayer. My wife was there, two of my girls were there. We were in the room, I had my arms around them, and I said, if I'm supposed to endure this pain, you know, for whatever reason that I don't even understand yet, I'm willing to do it. But could I please just have the next couple of hours so that I could at least get through this this experience? And it just dissolved. And I was able, you were there, you were in the audience, and I was able to go out there and do it. And then the pain returned the next day, and I went right back to that state, and I still do it now. And I can, I can feel it even now as we're talking about it a little bit here. And instead of cursing it, instead of being angry at it, I accept it as, uh, as my dharma. This is, you know, and whatever it is that I have to learn from it, generally speaking, Every difficulty I've had in my life, yeah. getting divorced, literally being uh, uh, someone who is addicted to uh, substances, including alcohol, um, letting go of uh, you know those kinds of uh, beliefs that those are terrible things that I should be ashamed of, they've been amongst my greatest teachers. Oh. And this pain is just another one of those things. And generally speaking, I now can go out and help people who live in chronic pain. Yeah. And you do a lot of this with yeah. your tapping. You know, I've seen you do it on stage, you know, with people. On, when we, in fact, when we were out in Australia, that one woman, what was it? She couldn't even... Well, there's one lady with a frozen shoulder who right. couldn't move her arm. Hadn't been able to move her arm in no, years. Year. In 20 minutes, she got it yeah, up like that. Yeah, you know? So it's like, and that comes from just accepting yourself and, and actually instead of cursing the pain, yeah. because when you curse the pain and get angry at it, you just, you get angry. Every cell of your oh. being goes through that same angry. And what you want to do is... Just get to that peaceful place within yourself where you say, you know, when you trust in yourself, when you trust in yourself, you're really trusting in the wisdom that created you, uh -huh. you know. And the wisdom that created you is infinite uh -huh. and it's formless. And so, so your thoughts are in that same category. Have thoughts that are aligned with that divine, that, that divine presence. Yeah. You'll see it going away. Yeah. Quote from A Course in Miracles. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. For a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal gentleness. What you remember is a part of you, for you must be as God created you. 
Let all this madness be undone for you, and turn in peace to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. It's about remembering our origination. I committed this passage to memory many years ago, and I use it as a way to remember who I truly am and where I really came from, particularly when I communicate with my Creator to stay on purpose and in spirit. Now I'd like to go through each of the messages in this observation from A Course in Miracles one by one. Number one, the memory of God comes to the quiet mind. We came from a quiet, peaceful place. That's the very essence of creation. So when our mind is filled with noisy dialogue, we shut out the possibility of remembering our spirit. Incessant chatter keeps us attached to the physical world and produces anxiety, stress, fear, worry, and so many of the emotional reactions that are decidedly removed from God-realization. We must minimize distractions when we wish to communicate with God. So being in nature, away from the artificial noises that invade our space, is helpful. But the most important thing to consider is how to keep our mind free from the dizzying, bewildering cascade of thoughts flowing through our head from morning till night, and even on into our dream state. It's been estimated that we have something like 60,000 separate thoughts every day. The real problem is that we have the same 60,000 thoughts today that we had yesterday. I've made the practice of meditation a part of my daily life because it's one way to quiet the mind so that the memory of God is accessible. So by learning to meditate, or at the very least shutting down the inner dialogue produced, directed, and acted upon by your ego, you can open up a space for remembering and returning to spirit. 2. It cannot come where there is conflict. In order for conflict to exist, there must be two opposing forces at work. That is, one force in the form of an idea, a point of view, a desire, or a contribution, directly clashes with another. Conflict defines our lives in many ways, as we oppose our partners, our children, our bosses, our neighbors, and even our countries. In politics, it's always one party versus the other. And the entertainment industry portrays battling points of view that are usually turned into violent scenes. Essentially, conflict requires two-ness. However, remembering where we came from involves our returning to the oneness of being in spirit. After all, there are no battling powers in the divine realm of spirit. There's only perfect oneness. And this is what we want to rejoin. We want to become one again with our Creator. And we can't retrieve this memory of God with a mind in conflict in any way. 3. For a mind at war against itself remembers not eternal gentleness. The second part of this teaching from A Course in Miracles reinforces that a combative mind cannot remember where it once resided in eternal gentleness. Obviously, you can't wage war and simultaneously focus on peace and gentleness, and it is eternal gentleness that you want to remember and rejoin. It's really quite simple to do this. Just close down the battlefield and surrender. Remove all of the artillery, send the soldiers home, and replace the instruments of war in your mind with thoughts of peace, tranquility, and surrender. Making your mind a place of peace is achieved by your own will, so steadfastly refusing to have thoughts of conflict allows you to activate the glory of remembering your spirit. 4. The fourth part of this quote. What you remember is a part of you. Every memory I have is me. What a glorious feeling it is to know this. We each have the power to retrieve any piece of ourselves that we desire and to experience it right here, right now, in this present moment. The great Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard once observed that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. In other words, if we can't go back and remember the spiritual bliss that defined us before the beginning, we've really abandoned a part of ourselves. As we move into communion with God, we must know that our inability to remember our spiritual origins is another way of really saying, quote, I'm unable to know myself because I have no recollection or memory of my spirit. Unquote. In fact, the corollary of this line from A Course in Miracles that we're processing right now would be, what you don't remember is not a part of you. In other words, if we fail to remember spirit, then obviously it isn't a part of us. And five, for you must be as God created you. As you communicate with your source of being, know that you're awakening a part of yourself that's just like God. In fact, you ought to try to approach communication with God by being as closely aligned to the way that you were created as possible. That is, by becoming a vibrational match to the all-loving Creator. 
come to the quiet moments in consultation with God in love, in peace, and without judgment. As the Course in Miracles is saying, you must be as you were created. So why put on a false mask and pretend to be anything or anyone else? In this way, you can open the channel of communication because you finally remember to be the way you were created. And that's the key to effective prayer. And as Gandhi once said, prayer is not an old woman's idle amusement. Properly understood and applied, it's the most potent instrument of action. And six, let all this madness be undone for you and turn in peace to the remembrance of God still shining in your quiet mind. Let's take the three suggestions in this teaching one at a time. First, a course says, let this madness be undone. The madness here is that of living in a state of conflict. In other words, we must make an attempt to transcend the dichotomies of our life because the division creates so much suffering and keeps us from living an inspired life. I remember a Ramdas lecture in which he said, I firmly come to the conclusion that there are no thems for me anymore. I can't be told who to hate, who to fight, who to subdue. I only see an us in my heart. All those messages to divvy up our world are insane. All our self-centeredness just drives our ego's insatiable appetite for making us special and putting other people down. The Course encourages us to be done with this madness once and for all, both in our minds and in our actions. And second, we're told to turn in peace to the remembrance of God. Once again, we know in our heart that we came from a place of peace. So any discord can't be the result of our Creator's actions. God cannot come to us when we pray from non-peace, so the solution is to return to the remembrance of Him and ask to be made an instrument of His peace. When I find myself out of sorts, I remember. And what I remember is to turn to peace right now in prayer. I become peace rather than anguish, and I feel the calmness I long for come over me like a wave of pleasurable relief. 